Welcome to Life Devotions and thank you for joining me today. The message of love is the title of this devotion. I think that we all should be a living epistle as the Apostle Paul says to the Corinthian church. We should all be easy to read what is the message of our life. Last, I think it was the end of November, beginning of December, I was in, uh, that was 2023, I was with uh, my dear friend, Phil Robert, who is married to my sister's daughter, Melanie. Oh, how I love Melanie and her brother, Brenton. The wonderful, wonderful children of God and ministers of the Lord. And Melanie had passed away. And I was there and the funeral was quite an, uh, quite a long one, about over three hours. It was a bit unusual, a bit different, but it was really powerful. And what came to me that every one of our lives has a message. Melanie's life had such a powerful message. To God be the glory. To God be the kingdom and the power and the glory. That was the message of her life. And her whole life was calling for people to love God and not self. To love God and not this world. The love of the world, the scripture says here in 1 John, is enmity with God in 1 John chapter 2. And that we love God with all of our heart. That is the great commandment that we read about in Deuteronomy 6 verse 5. And friends, I charge you in the name of the Lord Jesus. The message of our life should be obvious to everybody. When we pass on from this life to the life to come and enter into the inheritance of the saints in the light of which we now are partakers by His indwelling life, Christ indwelling life, what is the message we leave behind? Is it that people can say, you know, I, I want to love people like they loved. I want to forgive as they forgive. I want to bless as they blessed. I want to give as they give. You see, I have so many examples in my life. My father, Johan Masbach, who's with the Lord now. My mother, Wilhelmina Masbach, who is still with us at 96. She'll be 97 in June. Oh, I will never forget something my mother said to me. She was going through a horrific trial. I mean, a terrible trial. And they were trying to destroy my mom and dad. And my mom said something to me, I'll never forget when I went to go see her and the battle was so ferocious. She said, Robert, what these people that seek to destroy us don't understand is that you cannot destroy what is eternal. She knew that the life she lived in this body was the life of the Son of God that is eternal. Oh, how wonderful that statement so stuck with me. My father said something like that to me in 1978 when he said to me, when the Lord Jesus had saved me, when I'd broken my neck in my second vertebrae in two places, he said, when Jesus had healed me, he said, Robert, now you know your life is not your own. The scripture says that in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20, that we are not our own. Our spirit and our bodies are the Lord's for they have been purchased with his precious blood. And you know, these statements, or oh, I could tell you so many of my father's statements, my mother's statements, and other people that I met throughout history. Oh, I could, I'm tempted to start telling you these stories, but let's read here in 1 John 3, verse 11. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. You see, friends, this message is everlasting. It never changes. And we see it beautifully displayed throughout Scripture in the lives of so many. I look at the life of, of Abraham. I look at the life of Sarah, and I've learned so much from them. And yes, they made a painful mistake. Sarah was just so weary and weary of being barren and not able to give Abraham what she knew he so desired. And she then eventually said, okay, Aaron, I, I, I don't have my monthly cycle anymore. There's nothing I could do for you. Why don't you go in 
into my, 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 my maidservant, Hagar, uh, you know, the servant that I got from Egypt. And out of that was born Ishmael. And Ishmael represented that nature of Egypt, which is the spirit of the world. And God would never be able to fulfill his promise through that seed. And God had to say to Abraham, no, Abraham, no, Abraham, through your own son, your only son, who will be born through Sarah, will I fulfill my promise to you. And God, from a man as good as dead, as it says in Hebrews 11, brought forth as many as the stars of heaven. And I have so learned from that, that love of the Father, that faithfulness to His promise, that unwavering commitment to fulfill it, when maybe I had to face some of my past failings and thought, okay, Lord, I, I, I can't see it come to pass anymore. Now I'm not worthy of it. But I have seen that God is faithful to his promise if we just keep coming back to him and humble our hearts and repent of our mistakes. And I, I am so grateful that the Holy Spirit is so forbearingly long-suffering to lead us to repentance that we could say, Lord, I shouldn't have done that. That was wrong. Please forgive me. And that we could come and enter into that amazing love. And Abraham had that faithfulness of God in his heart towards Sarah and Sarah towards Abraham. And that for the last 41 years has been a secret of my marriage with Virginia. And I'm so grateful, I've learned. And you see, you have so many examples. Joseph with his brothers and, and Jacob with Esau and Jacob in the house of, of his father-in-law. Oh, what was his name now? Uh, it just won't come to me, but I know it so well, you know. And he had to learn a lesson there that yes, God blessed his father-in-law because the blessing was upon Jacob, but his father-in-law never learned the lesson that all good gifts and perfect gifts come from the Father of heaven. And he had a mindset about him that God could not show him his, himself through. And he said, when Jacob left, you took what was mine instead of God blessed you while we were together. That's a different heart, a different mind, you see, friends. And you can learn that message from the beginning and learn it as you read the scriptures in the heart of David with Saul, that David was given by the Lord power over Saul more than once, and yet he would take not his authority in his own hand, but he left it to God. He said, I will not touch God's anointed. I will do him no harm. And he didn't do it. And he waited on God to deal with it. Oh, how I've learned in love. And Virginia and I believe in this. This is the message from the beginning, Cain and Abel. And, and you go on and on and on. Sham, Ham and Japheth. When Ham saw his father's nakedness when he had fallen asleep without his clothes on, he told his brothers. And that exposed his dad and embarrassed his dad, for which he really suffered an enormous judgment upon this, his son called Canaan. And that represented that that nature was not the nature that represents God, but Sham would not look upon his father's naked, but together with his brother Jeff had walked backwards and covered his father's nakedness while he slept. And, and God shows that that spirit of not exposing people's failings, not exposing people's weaknesses is what God loves. Some people say, no, oh, you gotta do what's right. And yes, there are absolutely without question things we need to do that are right, but that is what Shem did. He went in and covered his father's nakedness. That was right, he dealt with it. He didn't leave it as it is, he dealt with it and things need to be done. But you, the examples throughout scriptures just go on and on and on. So let me take you to 1 John chapter one and um, 1 John chapter 1, um, hmm, no, chapter 2, yeah, here it is, sorry. Chapter 2, verse, uh, let's start at verse 10. He who loves his brother abides in the light, 
and there is no cause of stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness, walks in darkness, and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now go to chapter 1, verse 5. Chapter 1, verse 5. Oh, how I love this thought. This is the message, 1 John 1, 5. This is the message we heard from him and declared to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. For me, the safest place to be is in the light. No hidden, secret, underhanded methods and arts that I would hide through shame. Second Corinthians 4 verse 1 and 2. No, no, God forbid. No, I don't want to be deceitful in any form of fashion. I don't want to know dishonesty. God loves those who are upright and wholehearted and sincere and straightforward, who walk in the light of His holiness where nothing is hidden and where His Word constantly has complete access to deal with anything that needs dealing with in the deepest parts of our nature. For the Word of God is sharp and active and powerful, cutting us under even flesh and, 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 and spirit and, and bone and marrow and soul and spirit and brings revelation into the deepest parts of our nature and helps us to never allow anything that would corrupt us or defile us. No, my dear friends, we need to walk in that light. Chapter 4, we're almost there. Listen, chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let's love one another. Come on. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins, the peace offering to bring peace between us and God. Reconciliation is what that word means. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love has been perfected in us. Now in closing, and I'll read it from the Amplified. Oh, how I love this little thought. I really, really love this little thought. This chapter 4, verse 16 of 1 John. Listen to this. It's second. Well, let's start at the beginning. And we know, understand, recognize, and are conscious of by observation and experience and believe and hear and put our faith in and rely on the love that God cherishes for us. God is love. And he who dwells and continues in love dwells and continues in God. And God dwells and continues in him. In this union and communion with him, love is brought to completion and attains perfection within us that we may have confidence in the day of judgment and so forth. You know, dear friends, God wants to perfect his love in us. He wants our whole nature to be characterized by it. He wants that to be the message of our life. God is love, and he who loves is born of God. He who hates doesn't know God because God is love. Oh, friends, hate can come to any of us because of what we go through in life, but resist it like the devil himself and say no, no, no. Let your no become so forceful that hate knows your heart does not belong to it. Your heart belongs to God and His amazing love. Amen. Have a good day.